The first time James told me the the name that that you know he was working on that they come up with raw data, I, I remember that just sticking as an incredible title. Finding a title for your game is a very important thing. The first time he had explained to me um, the very early character concepts that ended up turning into you know Bishop, Saija, Boss, all the other characters that that people really love, like that was a big moment. That's when we really scoped down what we actually did. We took a section, a small section, out of the second level of Bullet Time Apex, and it essentially is what Hardpoint became later on, where you start off in an elevator, and the elevator descends, and you are at these two terminals, and enemies start coming to you at you through, through the, uh, the different doors. But definitely starting uh, raw data at that point was little more than a tech demo. We had, we had shown off what the, the tech was that we wanted to build in VR, uh, but there was no game there. there was, there was no progression through the, the game. There was no user interface. You were basically just loading into a floating platform, and everything had to be done through console commands. The first time we showed raw data was January 2016 at VRLA. And it was like, it was this kludgy demo. It was very unpolished, at least in the perspective that we have now. Um, and it, even back then, it was mind blowing. I mean, people were screaming, they were like, they were going nuts over this thing. But there was just a, a lot of limitations out of the gate from, and a lot of traditional stuff too, you'd be surprised how much of traditional game design and game development does translate to VR. The vast majority of it does. You know, just some of the basic stuff from weapon recoil to reaction times to enemy behavior, player interaction, that is all fairly traditional. Uh, but then on top of that, then there was all the new things, all the things that came in and they kept saying, oh, you can't do this in VR, oh, you can't do that in VR. And I'm like, well, why? Why can't you do these things? Like, well, the player can't move. I'm like, oh, baloney, we're going to solve this. You could, you know, and we just looked at other products and figured that out. Or, oh, you can't knock the player back, or you can't jump into the air, right? And one by one, we just kept focusing on things on raw data until we found solutions for these things. And we also, from the beginning, we wanted you to be this action hero. We wanted you to gain this huge amount of presence and be fully immersed in the environment. And so in order to accomplish that, we tried to move toward this thing we call essentially avatar embodiment, which means having the weapons holstered on your character. I think we all want to, you know, be that, you know, badass superhero. So uh, when you're putting together a character, you just kind of think about like, what do they, you know, what does the, the player want to be? When you're, when you pick up that katana, you pick up that gun, how do you see yourself? Raw data as a whole, like pulling back from it, raw data is entirely informed by everyone working at this company being a big fan of like a thousand different things be it various animes, various sci-fis, various fantasies, various ways. We're, we're all nerds here. And really wanting to capture the idea of being the, the, the titular badass in one of those uh, drove the conception and the, uh, and the creation of the entire rest of the world. And then we'd come into the conference room and we would listen to our favorite soundtracks from like the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, all the science fiction stuff. And we would see, like, what is it that they did that made those movies so awesome? You know, even though it's nostalgic, when you watch some of them today, like Total Recall, you still get amped up. So we wanted to see, okay, what is it that they did that made it that way? And see if we can recreate that in today's world. Like, at a certain point in game development, once it's kind of fleshed out enough, like once the world and the gameplay is kind of, you know, far along and it's kind of figured out, like, what it wants to be, um, the rest of the details almost write themselves. So it was at that point that we knew we were about six months out from uh, the release of the major uh, HMD headsets. We, the, you know, we had the Vive on the horizon, we had Oculus Rift with the Touch coming as well, and we knew that PSVR was somewhere out there, but a little further out, right? So from there we said, okay, well we want to be in that first batch of games that, that comes out on those platforms. So, and raw data is going to be right there. So we sat down to kind of sketch out how, like, what was the player progression? How, how do players unlock abilities over time? How do they unlock new levels? We came in with a lot of narrative ideas and we were building out our lore and our backstory and that was our 12, like we had like this 12 point plot progression and, and all this backstory to 
what had happened in the society on Earth and how it had evolved over time. And that was all there, you know, from the beginning. And of course, we started building out more and more and more. Probably the most amount of iteration on uh, any feature in raw data was on developing the different abilities of the characters. Uh, you know, some things had to be thrown away, some things kind of morphed and changed. Beyond just the art style and just the general design and aesthetics uh, from the technical side, um, showing off your hands and uh, having the full forearm and wrist. A lot of games at the time just essentially the, did a one-to-one -one mapping between the object that you were holding or just a floating hand cut off at the wrist. So that was, that was a new thing for VR at the time when we initially launched. Not many games had done that because it's difficult to have very hyper-realistic, well-simulated, well-animated hands that have many different grips and different custom animations that can be oriented with a variety of interactables in the environment. Since we're not showing the whole body anymore and we're only showing the hands, we can up res the polys really high and we're not spending texture space on the rest of the body so all of it can go into the hands. So when you're playing, you can get, you know, you can see the individual little air holes on a leather glove and stuff like that that normally if you're, you know, the, the second player person isn't quite as detailed. Well, actually, yeah, if you uh, take a close look at some of the labeling on Saija, um, there's, there's a few, like, inside jokes uh, with uh, some of the other devs here. There's a uh, Elder, once again, probably has the most layering to him as far as telling a story. Um, if you can look all over, there's, there's detail, like, little details. As a gamer, like, whenever I look at a game and, and, and as a character artist, the first thing I do is always, like, grab a, a sniper rifle or something like that and just zoom into all the details. You know, and look at all the, because I, I, I get it, like, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of love and hard work that goes into these uh, assets, not just the characters, but the environments, the props, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it pays to, you know, take a closer look at, uh, at the stuff, because we definitely put a lot of work into these, uh, into these assets. So we didn't really cut any corners. A lot of times we thought we couldn't move players around on platforms and things like that. We thought there was going to be a lot more issues than we had, although I'm sure it wasn't easy on the engineering front. Those guys made it happen, so kudos to them. I mean, they seem to be able to pull off anything, even though they think it might not be possible. You wind up seeing, bam, they did it, and it's really cool. We were, we were eager to get out on the market with the, the first wave of games, um, and we knew that we only had a, a short period of time to get that done. Uh, and early access allows you to, to release a game before before you've done all the hardest work of, of polishing and bug fixing and, and really hammering uh, the game to, to make it perfect at the end. Um, so we knew, okay, with six months, we could never release the kind of game we wanted to release in six months with that time, but uh, if we released an early access, we could, we could probably just build the first part of the game, show users the promise of raw data, uh, and say, hey, this is our plan to take this to done. This is all the rest you will get if you, if you join us in the early access. Uh, wagon. You know, it's taken us a long time to grow that from its initial, you know, title of Bulletin Apex to a much smaller version of raw data, which we showed at VRLA back in January of 2016, um, to then build that into a larger title that has tons of levels, uh, characters, abilities, multiplayer, PvP. It, it's taken us a long time to craft a game that we think is worthy of the marketplace. When we sell something, we want it to be a full title you know, that people can enjoy. It's not just a tech demo or something like that. We're, we're perfectionists at Servios, and we want to make something that will live on that people will be playing five years from now.